Good evening, Crazy Faith, and welcome to our weekly virtual broadcast. Thank you for being here with us this evening. This week, we all witnessed white supremacy at its core through the attempted coup of the U.S. Capitol building by terrorists spurred on by the baseless claims of election fraud by the current occupant of the White House. To many of us who have been privy to the seeds of violence that this man has sown in the past four years, this was an unfortunate, inevitable consequence of enabling white supremacy from the highest office in the land. This week has been described as the darkest in modern history, though for people of color, and those within marginalized communities, we have lived through the nightmare of white supremacy since the dawn of American existence. This was a storm that may not be over yet, and we as people of faith need to call on God now more than ever. Even though we are pre pre preparing for a change in political power, it can be hard to see how there will be any light at the end of this dark tunnel because although the White House occupant will be gone, the emboldened racist will not be. But we hope to encourage you this morning that despite the storm and these literal dark times, there will be glory, there will be victory after this. God is in the business of the impossible, and he will be a light at the end of the tunnel after this.
unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before God's presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is God that has made us and not we ourselves. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. So enter into God's gates with thanksgiving and enter into God's courts with praise. Be thankful unto God and bless God's holy name for the Lord is good. God's mercy is everlasting and God's truth endures to all generations praise ye the lord and now we pray the prayer that our lord and savior jesus christ taught us to pray when his disciples asked him lord how do you pray and he answered you pray like this our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done hallowed be thy name on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. On earth, on earth, as it is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, hallowed be thy name. And forgive us all of our trespasses, hallowed be thy name. As we forgive those who trespass against us, hallowed be thy name. And lead us not into temptation, hallowed be thy name. But deliver us from all that is evil, hallowed be thy name. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, hallowed be thy name. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen, it must be so, hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen, it must be so, hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen, it must be so, hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen, it must be so, hallowed be thy name. 59 verses 1 through 20. Listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are the hands of murderers, and your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews corruption. No one cares about being fair and honest. The people's lawsuits are based on lies. They conceive evil deeds and then give birth to sin. They hatch deadly snakes and weave spiders' webs. Whoever eats their eggs will die. Whoever cracks them will hatch a viper. Their webs can't be made into clothing, and nothing they do is productive. All their activity is filled with sin, and violence is their trademark. 
Their feet run to do evil and they rush to commit murder. They think only about sinning. Misery and destruction always follow them. They don't know where to find peace or what it means to be just and good. They have mapped out crooked roads and no one who follows them knows a moment's peace. So there is no justice among us and we know nothing about right living. We look for light but find only darkness. We look for bright skies but walk in gloom. We grope like the blind along a wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. Even at brightest noontime, we stumble as though it were dark. Among the living, we are like the dead. We growl like hungry bears. We moan like mournful doves. We look for justice, but it never comes. We look for rescue, but it is far away from us. For our sins are piled up before God and they testify against us. Yes, we know the sinners we are. We know we have rebelled and have denied the Lord. We have turned our backs on our God. We know how unfair and oppressive we have been, carefully planning our deceitful lies. Our courts oppose the righteous and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets and honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained him. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. He will repay his enemies for their evil deeds. His fury will fall on his foes. He will pay them back even to the ends of the earth. In the West, people will respect the name of the Lord. In the east, they will glorify him. For he will come like a raging flood tide driven by the breath of the Lord. The Redeemer will come to Jerusalem to buy back those in Israel who have turned from their sins, says the Lord. Deuteronomy 25 verses 13 through 16 from the New Living Translation. You must use accurate scales when you weigh out merchandise, and you must use full and honest measures. Yes, always use honest weights and measures so that you may enjoy a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. All who cheat with dishonest weights and measures are detestable to the Lord your God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just... We stand in awe of you, of, of your faithfulness, of how you work in our lives, Lord. We just, we come to say thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord, for your presence in our lives. But we ask you, Lord, today in the midst of this latent white supremacy that we have seen this week, these attacks <clears throat> against your people, God, we just, we ask that you give us the spirit of courage to fight against this injustice, to press our leaders, to get them out of those elected positions if they will not fight for the unjust, fight against the injustice and for the justice that all of your people deserve, and especially people of color and marginalized communities. Lord, we just ask you to give us that courage and that strength to keep up this fight. This fight is long. The road is long. We are weary. We are tired, but we know we must not give up, and we ask for your strength, God, and be with us as we continue to push along <clears throat> and fight against the evils of this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well. I hope your spirit is okay after the crazy things that happened this week. Um, kind of hard sometimes to keep yourself grounded when so much is swirling around. And so I'm hoping that your your spirits are getting better. If they're if they're not perfectly better now, and I hope that you are keeping your hope and your faith intact and leaning on God because that's really all that we can do. This is the second Sunday of the new year. Um, this is the second Sunday of a year that has already been tumultuous, but this is also the second Sunday of a year where we still have our Lord and our God and our Savior. And so and today we're doing Holy Communion, and we're doing it with brown bread. 
um, to symbolize that the body of Jesus the Christ was a, a brown man. He was a Palestinian Jew, and we should remember that and honor that. It was a black man who was done in by members of the government, by the empire, because he wouldn't bow to the empire. He stayed faithful to God. And so that's why we're doing Holy Communion with brown bread. Um, and we say, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We confess, Lord God, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We, we confess that we have done things we should not have done, and we did not do things that we should have done. We have thought thoughts mm, that we should not have thought. We have given in to our own base emotions. We have done things, Lord, that are not pleasing to you. But we are grateful, God, that you are God, that you are not as small as we are or as incapable of loving and forgiving as we are. So we come to you confessing the ways in which we have fallen short. And we ask you, Lord God, to help us to be better, uh, to, to, to just work on it and work on it, and to be children in, in what we do, your children in what we do, not just by saying it. And we ask you to hear this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior took bread. And uh, when he had given thanks... When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, In a little while you will see me no longer, but every time you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. This is a symbol of my body, which will be broken for you and for many. And he ate the bread. In the same manner, he took the cup. It was filled with red wine. Um, and red wine was taken at the Passover, to make people remember that it had to be the blood of the firstborn, the best of the flocks of the people that had to be sacrificed in order to, for people to be made at one with God. That's why we call Jesus the Lamb of God. His blood was going to flow over the altar of the earth so that we could be made at one with him. It was God's sacrifice of his only son. James Cohn says that he hung on the lynching tree, that the cross was the lynching tree, and he was lynched merely for being uh, an obedient child of God. And he knew that that was what he was called here to do. So he took the cup filled with the red wine. And he said, in a little while you will see me no longer. But every time you drink this cup, from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. This is a symbol of my blood, which will be shed for you and for many. This will be the symbol of the blood that you see every year when you go to the Passover and you go up in that temple and the, you kill the animals or the fatted calves are killed and the blood runs down the side of that hill into the brook called Kedron. Forevermore, this will be the blood that will, be, will have been shed for you and for many. And as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are grateful to you for you doing what we would not do, could not do, would not want to do. How incredible it was that you were obedient even unto death so that we could be made at one and have a chance for a good life and an abundant life in you, through you, and for you. And so as we let these elements go into our systems, Lord God, cleanse us and we will be cleansed. Wash us and we shall be washed. And make it, Lord God, that on this second Sunday of a new year, when so much is swirling around us, bothering our spirits and keeping us um, un, un, uh, in a place where we don't even want to be, that we will remember these elements and we will seek them in our own souls and ask those elements, those parts of you in us, to calm us and to bring us ever closer to you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. So I ask you to pray with me today on the subject, what God says about double standards. What God says about double standards. There are a lot of people today who are hurting. I mean, they are hurting and they are mad and they're insulted about what happened this week in the nation's capital. Spurred on by the president, no less, a group of MAGA supporters walked down Pennsylvania Avenue and stormed the Capitol building. It was amazing. It was remarkable. They pushed past the paltry number of law enforcement officers who were there 
Then they ascended the stairs to the Capitol building, where they broke windows and fired guns at doors and at windows, and finally got inside of the building, where they damaged property, used the bathroom on the floor, smeared feces in different locations, carried Trump and Confederate flags into that space, hung off of walls, literally fired their guns again, and just completely desecrated a sacred place, what has been a sacred place for America. In the end, five people lost their lives. It was hard to watch because in and of itself what we were seeing was beyond belief. The word is that the event was planned in plain sight over the internet primarily for weeks. We knew to expect something because the president had notified his followers and told them to come to Washington on January 5th and to expect something to happen that would be wild. He knew who was coming. He knew what they had been told to do. There were nonprofit organizations that were collecting the funds that would be necessary to pull off their check because, because trust me, that whole thing had to be funded. People came on buses and planes. That event had to have been funded. So these nonprofit organizations were collecting funds that would be necessary to pull off their attack on the Capitol building because they are for one, for, uh, because they are uh, uh, 401c4s as opposed to 501c3s. 501c4s as opposed to 501c3s, they don't have to tell anybody where they get their money from. So we don't know really which corporations and which individuals funded this event, but it was funded. They were there because they were mad because of the outcome of the November election. Their guy lost. And as much as he pushed the narrative that the election had been rigged, he just couldn't get anybody to, no, well, he could get some people, millions of people, but he couldn't get the courts to buy into what he was claiming. He couldn't do it. Historically, this man has always said elections are rigged if he has lost or has expected to lose. In 2016, when he lost the Iowa primary, he accused Ted Cruz of stealing the election and accused him of fraud. Darn funny thing, just like what he said this year on his Twitter account. Back then, he wrote, quote, Ted Cruz didn't win Iowa. He stole it. That is why all of the polls were so wrong and why he got more votes than anticipated bad with his you know, usual exclamation point. It's his pattern. He just cannot lose. It has to be somebody's fault. Somebody has to have done something wrong. Um, and if it appears that he has lost, um, he works and he works and he works to reverse the loss or do something, anything that will keep him in the winner's circle. That he accused Cruz of the same thing that he's saying happened in November and in this November election, and yet Cruz helped pull off Wednesday's debacle, debacle is sickening, but it happened. The event was carefully and artfully coordinated with help by attorneys in general, attorneys general in Alabama and in Georgia. Police officers from cities across the country were there as a participants from as far away as Seattle, Washington. Even though the president announced that there would be a big gathering on the day the Congress was meeting to count the electoral college votes, the Capitol Police were scarce. Some appeared to remove barriers so that the rioters could actually get into the Capitol building. There is a picture of one officer taking a selfie with the rioter. Um, and there's another picture of a police officer who fl helped to flush the eyes of a guy who had been, whose eyes had been affected by the tear gas. Guess what? There were no horses. There were no tanks. There were no long guns, there were no police and riot gear, none of that which we always see when black folks protest the ongoing injustice that we suffer at the hands of police. In pictures, we saw rioters casually walking through the Capitol building like they were on a high school field trip. We saw police officers helping, helping, helping rioters up the stairs of the building and down the stairs as well. We saw police officers moving the barriers for the rioters. We saw so much that was astounding to see. We saw police officers doing what they would never do in terms of helping people in any of the protests that we've had. We have seen and felt police beat us, spray tear gas on us, put us in handcuffs and arrested and more. Yet, yes, 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 there has been violence at some of our protests, but not the kind of violence we saw on Wednesday. And usually the violence is the exception and not the rule. And it's usually carried out by, pe by a few people, not the masses, who simply want their voices heard so that change can take place. And in none of our protests has there been an attack on government buildings. I've never seen anything like it. 
Back in the summer, some government buildings were attacked in, in Wisconsin, and I'm not sure, we're not sure who was the culprit, because there were agent provocateurs, and they always show up on black people, right, because they want to do what they want to do, and they know that the black people will get blamed for it. But when the president saw this attack, I think it was on a fire station or a police station, um, he who eats and thrives on racist rhetoric sent secret unidentified police into Wisconsin, saying that attacking federal property was not allowed and was punishable for up to 10 years. Wow. Then there looks like there ought to be a whole bunch of people going to prison for years based on what we saw on Wednesday. Because most of the federal buildings uh, were, that federal building was attacked and he, right now, has said nothing. He said, we love you. Basically, he said, you did a good job. Now go home. You have to stop the violence. I was floored. I think many of us were floored. And reports are, were out that he was pleased, actually pleased with what he saw happening. There yeah, we saw it. Everybody saw it. The disparity. The disparity in the behavior of police when it comes to black and white people. Had that group been an angry black crowd, we, they don't care who, what we would have been mad at, but had it been a black crowd or merely a group of predominantly black people who were peacefully protesting with no weapons, they wouldn't have been able to get within a half mile of the Capitol building, maybe even more than a half mile. There would have been horses with police sitting on them with helmets on their heads and billy clubs in their hands. There would have been tanks and police officers on the ground, three and four lines deep, standing right in front of the protesters, making an impenetrable line so that the black people would not have been able to get through. There would have been tear gas and rubber bullets. There is no way black people could have done what those white people did. But in, this is America, and disparity in policing has been and continues to be the issue that drives people in our communities to the streets to protest as a way to get heard. We don't want destruction. We don't want to destroy the nation's capital. We don't want to destroy the government. We have never tried to overthrow the government in spite of the way the government has treated us historically. All we have wanted is justice. We've wanted it for hundreds of years. We want fairness in housing and employment and education and in policing. We see white officers coming toward us, not to ask questions about what's going on, but to break us up, break us down, and beat us into submission. They shoot first or beat first and ask questions later. They arrest us when they don't even know what they're going to arrest us for. I heard one of the protesters on Wednesday cry out, you did this to us, you did this to us, the government did this to us, we were good people, we were law-abiding people, but you did this to us, we want our country back. And from what we are seeing, many, many, too many in law enforcement must feel the same way. Our history is riddled with violence carried out against black people, and so often police have been participants. When Greenwood in, in Oklahoma was destroyed by a white mob, police participated and or just stood by and watched. When Vernon Damer was murdered by white vigilantes, they were mad because he was registering people to vote. Police knew it, and they watched what happened. They knew about the plan. They knew the Klan's person who ordered the hit. The daughter of Damer said she remembers her father fighting back after their home was set on fire by angry white folks. They were sitting outside waiting for medical help after her dad had kind of you know, warded some of those people off with his gun. But he was in bad shape. And she said, um, they, they, she sat there, or they sat there waiting for, for medical help. And she looked at his father and he was in bad shape. His skin was falling off of his arms. Police knew. And they participated, but they did nothing. It was law enforcement that participated in the murders of the three civil rights workers. When search parties were looking for their bodies, you know what? They found an untold number of black bodies in shallow graves, in rivers, and lakes. Bodies of people whose disappearance had never been talked about. When white folks attacked people in Elaine, Arkansas, police did nothing. When people tried to get away from the floodwaters called by Hurricane Katrina, Officers stopped them as they were running for their lives and attacked them and killed some of them. There's a man named Henry Glover, and, um, and his case still bothers me. He was accused of looting, but it turns out he wasn't. But you don't have to have done what police say you've done. You just get accused of it. Police used um, an, an excuse, this accusation of looting, to, to beat him. And they attacked him, and they killed him, and they cut off his head. And then they put his body in a car, and then they set the body on fire. What? What? I don't know. Maybe he was getting a, trying to get a loaf of bread or some water. It was awful down in Louisiana during Katrina, but it doesn't matter. They cut his head off, and they set his body on fire in that car. 
There are so many cases like that. When people objected to the murder of Trayvon Martin, the police attacked the protesters. When people took to the streets after the murder of Michael Brown, the police responded to their violence with violence of their own, not with officers tending to the wounded. When people took to the streets after the murder of George Floyd, police and the justice system went after the protesters. Throughout our history, we have seen nothing but a double standard when it comes to black people and injustice. Because of white supremacy, an ideology which teaches that some people are superior than others and who are therefore more deserving of better treatment, we have seen a double standard. Police come into our protests with a different mindset. They come into our communities and into our situations with the belief that black people are bad and deserve any violence they get from law enforcement. They believe that Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy with a toy gun, was inherently bad because he was black, and they gunned him down in seconds after coming up on him. They believe that Corey Goodson and Andre Hill were criminals, and they shot them dead, Corey Goodson in the back. And of course, a grand jury has found that the shooting was justified of Jacob Blake, the shooting of Jacob Blake shot seven times in the back by police officers. The grand jury said this week it was justified. It's like tear, tear, too bad. For a while, um, we don't understand. We, we, we don't understand what it is. It's the history. Uh, we, have, we see and we have lived with this double standard when it comes to policing since we have been in this country. Slave patrols were formed as early as 1740 in the North. This stuff didn't start in the South. Which were made up of young men given permission to hunt black people down and kill them if they felt it necessary. For a while, white men were required to serve in the slave Patrols, just like over in in Israel, the the kids are required to serve in the in the military. For a while in this country, white men were required to serve in the slave and slave patrols. And then later there came the the fugitive slave laws, which again deputized white citizens to hunt, shoot, and kill black people at will, reportedly to keep them from escaping their enslavement. We know the story, and we are wrestling with our anger today. My job is to get us to draw near to God. Our anger is about the situation. And if we have a question, it's probably, why is it that God doesn't change the hearts of the people who are stubbornly aligned with white supremacist thinking? But our biggest anger might be about the double standard. Again, if these protesters have been black, everybody in this country knows the outcome would not have been like it was on Wednesday. We had a group of terrorists who did to our company, to our capital what the Taliban has wanted to do for years. There are, there are those who hate this country, and they hate it so bad that they would have wanted to destroy it, but they don't have to worry about it. The Taliban doesn't have to worry about it. They understand that they... They don't need the Taliban to do what they want to do. They have white supremacist ideologues who will destroy the country themselves. They don't need to waste money to train people to do what they want to do or save money to get them on jets to travel to our country. White Americans, these these supremacists, these these people that I'm calling thugs, the people who have participated in this thing on on Wednesday, uh, on, uh, they're 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 destroying the country, and they'll do anything they want to destroy the country. They know that they can do it and get away with it because of the double standard and law enforcement that is practiced in this country. So what do we do? How do we handle our anger? The scripture today read from Isaiah. It makes it clear that God wants justice, but many people who call themselves Christian and who, do, who read the Bible do not read much of the Hebrew scriptures, and they especially avoid the scriptures, the prophets, which illustrate God's displeasure with injustice. God says in Isaiah, announce to my people their rebellion. Day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced justice and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. They are insulted. <clears throat> they are insulted that God seems not to notice their fasting, their offerings, and their presentation of religiosity. But God isn't fooled or moved. He says, only says that, that they only fast to quarrel and then to fight and then ask, is, it, is that the fast that I, that I choose? And God runs down the emptiness of a fast which is done by people who ignore the will of God. God continues, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your own house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourselves from your own kin? That's what God says. That's what the prophet has God saying in the book of Isaiah. God loves all of us. God, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, is not a Christian. The sovereign God created us all and loves us all no matter who we are. God loves those who love her and those who ignore her. God wants justice for everybody. And when that's not happening, God grieves. God even wants justice for those clowns that were in D.C. this week. God grieves when we mess up, when we move away from him. We don't move toward him, as the Holy Communion um, um, reminds us that we're supposed to do. They move away from him, and God grieves. In the 59th chapter of Isaiah, the prophet writes, See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that you cannot hear, so that he cannot hear. In verse 15 of that chapter, the prophet writes that the Lord saw the rampant injustice, and quote, it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene, so his own arm brought him victory. God sees the injustice. God sees the double standard. It isn't a new thing. In the book of Deuteronomy, Yahweh remember, admonishes against doing that, doing that double standard thing. One treatment for the rich people and another rich, uh, uh, treatment for the poor people. One treatment for the, for the, for the high in society and another, of the, uh, another form of treatment for the people who are not so um, high in society. God doesn't like that. Yahweh admonishes against doing it. He admonishes them to stop playing that game. And in the book of Deuteronomy, the law says, you shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, large and small. You shall not have in your hand, your house two kinds of measures, large and small. You shall only have a full and honest weight. You shall only have a full and honest measure so that your days may be long in the land that your God is giving to you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, that's that double standard thing, all who act dishonestly are abhorrent to the Lord your God. In other words, people have been dishonest and unfair to each other from the beginning of time. Those who have money cheat uh, those who do not. Those who have power resort to dishonesty to keep their power at the expense of those who put them in power. I'm reading about Ronald Reagan and studying how he became the darling of white conservatives. But you know what? The wealthier he got, the more distant he got from the goals of justice. He lifted up the name of God. He was good at that. But as a supporter of free enterprise, which meant that only many people would suffer economically, and he began to believe that it was God's will. But some people were better than others. The white people were more um, honest and, and more worthy of good things than were black people. But that isn't the God of the Bible. All of us have a tendency to ignore parts of the Bible that bother us or that are distasteful to us. This being fair message thing is one of them. Just like the direction from God found in the prophets that God's people are mandated, mandated to practice justice are likewise scriptures that many ignore. But on this day, I want us all to stop and breathe. This has been a rough week. Stop and breathe. Because you know what? We have more difficult days ahead of us. The people who were involved in the violence on Wednesday are not going to stop. They are just getting started. There will be more violence. There will be more violence. You understand what I'm saying? Gird yourselves. That as you gird up, remember this. God is on the side of justice. God is not a supporter of a double standard. Remind yourselves that all of us matter. Draw near to God, the scriptures say, and God will draw near to you. God is not a supporter of the double standard. Draw near to God and find strength in remembering the words found in the Bible. If the news anchors and others were surprised by what they saw Wednesday, there's, <coughs> there's no telling how shocked they will be at what these people will do this week, next week. So I need for you to gird yourselves. And in so doing, emit a spirit of confidence that God sees all of this that's going on. Stay away from places where there will be violence. Do not fight them as they will fight others. Remember that there is a double standard of justice that God does not like but to which we are vulnerable. Stay out of God's way. There was a woman who called somebody crying. She said, she said, I believed in him. She was crying, talking about the president. 
I want to know that my president did not lie to me. And I want to say, oh, sweetie, you're not going to know that because he did lie to you. But she was crying because it was a relative of hers who had been killed in the capital violence. She's jacked up because she believed more in a man than she did in God. So gird yourself, number one, with the mercy and the love and the grace in God. Do not believe in the evil that's in front of you. Believe in the good that is over you and around you. Gird yourself up with the mercy and the love and the grace of God. Remember what your grandparents taught you about God. And remember that they learned from their forebears who had lived through the violence of white folks a long time ago. Gird yourselves with God and with the testimonies of the faithful. Number two. Make time for God every single day. The song in the psalm say, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Every single day, lift up your eyes to get your strength. Look up and see the glory of God that's around us. Look up and, and, and know that there is nothing that God cannot do. There is nothing. You can't do anything or we can't do anything but lean on God and trust that God will make the crooked places straight. And you know why God will do it now? Because God has done it before. Make time for God every day. Think back to what our ancestors must have gone through, how they had to find a way that was made straight for them, but they did it, and they believed that God would do that. Look, make time for God every single day. And finally, commit to study. Study this country. Study the stuff. Study your Bible. Study the history lessons. Make time to study. We have been through awful times before, and as you study and you see the times that we've been through, you will believe. Your spirit will be comforted, and you will know that we will get through this. Reading and studying helps center us and remind us that God is sovereign, not Trump, not pre the previous presidents, not kings, not pharaohs, all of those people who thought that they were greater than God got theirs, didn't they? They got theirs. Read the history and remind yourselves that as our ancestors fought and they fought with their faith and with their minds, so we have to do the same thing today. Don't give power to evil. Don't do it. Drain it of its toxicity and do what you can do to strengthen your spirit. And remember that our help and strength doesn't come from those who want to kill us. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Stay steadfast. This situation has come about because of anger that black people voted and helped get Trump out of office. Black people stayed in lines. Black people fought against that suppression. Black people stood in lines for hours in all kinds of weather. Black people voted Trump out. And black people voted Raphael Warnock and, and Mr. Ossoff into office. Remember the victories that we get when we stick with God. Life is about standing in line for God. Life is about knowing how to wait on the Lord and get strengthen while we wait. We stay in the line, just like the voters did. When it rains, we stay in the line. When it's hot, we stay in the line. When the, when the winds are waving, we stay in the line. We stay in the line. We keep our focus. We keep looking up. We remember what everybody has been through before us, and we have strength to, to carry on and strength to stay in the journey. Continue, my sisters and my brothers, to look to the hills from whence comes your help. Don't look at these these people with the guns and the mega hats. Up. They don't matter. The only thing that matters is that we understand that the metaphor of us staying in the line is the metaphor we need to hold on to. We will stay in the line. We will be faithful to God and we will have the victory because you know what? There is no evil that is greater than our God. Amen and amen. So I want you to listen with me to this song to be reminded of what we're supposed to do. Let's listen.
And so as we leave this week, we don't know what's coming, but gird yourselves up, stay committed, stay attached to God, and study and study and study, and remember this song or some song that makes you feel the energy of God go through your spirit, and you know what? We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right because we've been all right before in bad and crazy times. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we come to you grateful, grateful, grateful that you are God, that you have kept us um, and sustained us through some awful times already. So we know that you will be with us. Some of us are mourning. Some of us are sad. Some of us are afraid. God, we don't know what's getting ready to happen in this country right now. But this is what we do know, that you are the same today as you were yesterday. And you will be the same tomorrow. And no matter when evil comes to try to steal our joy and take our spirits, if we stay with you, if we, if we internalize the elements that we took today for Holy Communion, we will be all right. And so loving Spirit, Spirit of God, loving Mother God, loving Father God, loving God of us all, come to us now and massage our spirits, tenderize our spirits, or strengthen our spirits so that we will be able to receive you in the way we need to receive you in order to let people know that the God we serve is real and let the people of God say amen and amen. God bless you. God keep you. Stay with God. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in and dialoguing with us today. We hope that something in sermon or song has inspired you. If there are prayer requests, please let us know in the chat so that we can pray for you this week. Our mission here at CFM is providing direct service to marginalized communities and doing justice work in the constant fight against injustice, and especially now. We will start over collecting socks for the homeless community 2021. So if you would like to help us in this endeavor, feel free to visit our sock web store at the link listed in the description box or email us if you'd like to send a donation directly to us. Join us for Bible study tomorrow, Monday, January 11th and every Monday. We're studying the story of Joseph and have really delved in in detail to the chapter of Genesis. We really have lots of fun and we just learn so much about the story. So please join us and please invite a friend. Email us for the Zoom link. If you want to help us in our outreach efforts, you can donate through our website, Venmo, or Cash App. Our Venmo is crazy-faith, our Cash App is Red Dip, and our website is crazyfaithministries.org. For those who are on Facebook want to see a playback of our service, you can visit our church online platform at crazyfaithministries.online.church. Now go out this week and help one another, and we hope that you continually embody our motto and that we have come to worship and we leave to serve. Have a great week and we'll see you later next week. Bye.